Yeah. That is yeah. how critical safeguarding your data is. Mm. Yeah. No matter the industry or the size of the company, data is increasingly playing a large role in your business. It's oftentimes the critical sauce to yeah. your business's recipe, even with the increasing importance of AI. Have you heard of terms like network segmentation, IDS, IPS, DLP? I can keep going on. Some of these terms used to be really common on premise, but we never really figured out what it would look like in the cloud world, specifically in the AWS cloud world. So in this conversation, I have Tyler Warren. He is from the company USAA, where him and his team implemented data parameter, which AWS has been talking about for some time, but there were not a lot of use cases. So I finally found someone, by the way, Tyler and his team also gave a good talk about this, which I'll leave a link for uh, this in the show notes somewhere or in the description. But I just wanted to bring this conversation in front of you because they are talking about data parameter in the AWS cloud using native services like SCP, VPCs, and the challenges they had, what was the reason they went down that path, what were some of the things that they found were probably easier starts. Why does everyone at every stage in their AWS or cloud journey need to think about data security? By the way, if you haven't considered this, I would definitely recommend looking at data security as a problem, how you're addressing it in your cloud environments especially when there are no native DLPs in your case, which is the case with AWS, that there is no native DLP. So these are preventative measures you are able to implement that they were able to take advantage of. So enjoy this conversation with Tyler. And if you know someone who is considering putting a data parameter on how do I network segment in AWS Cloud or how do I make sure that the data is only being sent to known regions of AWS or known AWS accounts in your organization or known hybrid environment. So many layers to this conversation. I hope you enjoy this conversation and please do share it with any friends or colleagues of yours that are investigating this space, a data parameter problem that they are trying to solve in the AWS Cloud. If you're listening to this Apple Spotify, please definitely give us a review or rating because that helps more people like Tyler get discovered by us. And we also get to talk to more interesting people like Tyler and others who have been on the podcast before as well. If you are, however, watching this on YouTube or LinkedIn, please give us a follow, subscribe, maybe, maybe even the like button as well, because that definitely lets the algorithm know that you want to know more about this as well. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I look forward to talking to you in the next one. We interrupt this episode for a message from this episode's sponsor, Threat Locker. Detection tools like EDR keep letting malware slip by and harm businesses of all sizes. But unlike EDR, ThreatLocker blocks all unapproved software and actions, mitigating cyber attacks. ThreatLocker detects and alerts you of blocked indicators of compromise so you can take action. Learn more about ThreatLocker Detect or book a demo today at www.threatlocker.com. Now back to the episode. In the Cloud Security Podcast, I've got Tyler Warren and we're talking about something interesting as data parameter. But before I got into this, welcome to the show, Tyler. I appreciate you coming here, Tyler. Can you share a bit about yourself, what's your career like been so far? Thanks for having me, Ashish. My name is Tyler Warren. I am a security engineer at USA, which is United States Automobile Association, a large financial services company located in Texas. I help lead our security engineering efforts across public cloud. So mm -hmm. all the major hyperscalers. My journey to cloud security is probably a little more winding, a little different than most, if there is such a thing. I spent the first eight or nine years of my career non-technical roles, helping companies start companies, did everything that you could do for a small startup, oh. sales and marketing and product design and warehousing and you name it, I, I probably did it. I, I actually didn't do anything technical. I didn't learn how to code till I was 30. I'm, I'm 41 now. So I was a little late to the game, graduated from a coding boot camp, made a career change, started working initially for as a government contractor for the DOD. Did yep. that for several years before moving on to, to USA, where I'm not at now. Now, I've been here for about five years and really kind of right when we started our cloud journey as a company. Okay. And that's pretty awesome, by the way. Coming from a non-technical background, you probably have a very unique perspective of the technical world as well. I really appreciate when people from other fields come into cybersecurity or in tech in general, because... You bring in perspective that no one else would be able to see. Yeah. There's so much to gain from, especially in terms of soft skills yeah. that you get with sales in general. Like I wish everyone should go into sales. Like you gain so much experience for having the viewpoint of the customer yeah. and like taking that to the engineering side, especially on the security side where we'll talk about this, but I view our application teams as our customers. Like mm. how can I help my customers be successful? I think it's an incredibly valuable you know, viewpoint to have. Uh, it's helped me especially. Yep, 100%. And, and talking about the engineering team and the effort that goes into keeping them safe as well, 
what are de- data parameters? I think uh, it's worthwhile kind of laying the groundwork for people who probably would be wondering as to what does data parameter have to do in this context of cloud security? If, if you read the AWS documentation, you'll probably hear the phrase pretty often. That is, it's a way to ensure that trusted resources are accessed uh, from by trusted identities from trusted networks. What is a trusted resource? What is a trusted identity? What is a trusted network? That's going to depend on context. But I kind of frame the definition as a set of controls or guardrails to ensure your data is accessed in accordance with your organization's requirements, Mm -hmm. while also ensuring that your business has the appropriate agility to move fast and grow. You know, both of those things, whether it's data perimeter or not, right, having a good set of controls also and allow your business to thrive, I think are equally important. The analogy I like to use, and this probably says a lot about where I am in my life is, I have a three-year-old son and potty training him, right? It has been one of the, the I, don't know, I, would say, I wouldn't call it fun, but it's been interesting. But like, so when you're right there and, <laughs> and he is going, everything looks great. Everything's yeah. great. Your, your guard rolls are up and, and your, everything's working. The moment you turn around to grab your phone, it, it's, it's going everywhere, me. right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> in, this, in this analogy, your data is going everywhere. It's all over the place. Are you going to be able to go back and clean it up? The stuff that you missed? Who knows? I don't know. Hopefully. Yeah. That's the analogy I use. You make sure you've got guardrails to ensure that your data is only being exchanged with the appropriate partners. I, I will say data perimeter is not a new concept. It's been repackaged like a lot of things in cloud with a new snazzy buzzworthy phrase. Even the AWS white paper that came out in 2021, yeah. that's over three years ago. Yeah. In cloud years, that's like a decade, right? Yeah. If you spent time in an on-premise environment, you're probably familiar with things like a firewall or intrusion prevention systems or yeah. data loss prevention. Network segmentation is the main one yeah. um, that I think most people are familiar with how you ensure that certain parts of your data center can only be accessed from certain places. All of that is still present in cloud as you still have network access control lists, security groups, firewalls. It's really with AWS and all of the other cloud providers and the services that they require an additional layer of identity controls. And that's really the biggest difference. Identity and authorization is what data perimeter in the cloud seeks to address. And and anything else, it's an additional layer of control that can also add additional layer of complexity to any solution. Oh, actually, it's a good way to put it because I remember in the on-premise days, you probably, once you're in the network, you can go wherever. It doesn't really matter the identity. It's primarily the network zones that protected, hey, there's a restricted zone, DMZ, all of that. Whereas it it doesn't really matter if it was Ashish or Tyler or whoever. As long as you're in Mm -hmm. there, you basically have access to most of it. And But clearly, very different to cloud. Yeah, the thick candy shell, right? Like hard on the outside, gooey on the middle. Yeah. You're totally right. And, and I do think one of the biggest differences is the controls that are applied in cloud, especially when it comes to data perimeter, yeah. are pretty coarse-grained in nature, right? Think about the use of service control policies or resource policies or VPC endpoint policies. You're really trying to be coarse-grained with them as opposed to really... A, least privilege with you get identity policies, right? Think about, hey, I don't want to see principles from this part of my network accessing resources in this. So it's a very coarse grained approach in nature. Would you say, was there a gap in AWS? Is that why you guys went down this path as well? And I I don't mean in in the context of that, hey, is that a security capability that most people should think about? And probably it's not as a service from AWS. It's not like a guard duty or security that you slap on and you start using. I think that's where I'm coming from. Is is, is that why you guys can do it? Yeah. So I would say, I I don't know if it's it's AWS trying to address a gap. I would say it's AWS's approach in providing guidance to customers on how to adapt all of the existing capabilities AWS offers to the needs of their customers. Due to the nature of all the capabilities AWS gives you, whether it's, again, service control policies, permission boundaries, resource policy, identity policies, session, all of the things they give you, yeah. there's an infinite way to adapt and twist AWS to your needs, right? If you asked 100 companies, how do you do X, Y, Z, you're gonna need 100 different answers, right? Mm-hmm. To your point, I think this is not something where you can just go check a box and say, that data perimeter thing, it's done, right? You're going to have to adapt the existing controls available to you 
creature needs. And that's what I think the white paper really tries to address. And it's, again, depending on your circumstance, it can be pretty complex. Yep. I'm going to link the talk that you guys had at Forward Classic as well. I think it's worthwhile covering. And you guys have went into a lot more architecture diagram and detail in there as well. One thing I had a thought of when I was looking at this or listening to the talk, is this for everyone? As in, should everyone should do this from day one? A lot of us, we're interacting with enterprise, large companies, massive cloud footprint. Sounds like a great idea for network segmentation and having the data parameter part. But are we recommending people should do it in the beginning as well? Because sounds like it should be the thing. So what I hope is that if you're an existing company or just starting, that you have a top-down holistic security strategy. And so I think data parameter needs to be a first-class citizen in that strategy. Is this approach for every, is data perimeter something that everyone should address? I would ask you this. If you washed all of your data tomorrow, would you be in business? For many, the answer is probably not, right? Yeah. That is yeah. how critical safeguarding your data is. Yeah. Yeah. No matter the industry or the size of the company, data is increasingly playing a large role in your business. It's oftentimes the critical soft to yeah. your business's recipe, even with the increasing importance of AI, which you have an entire podcast devoted to, yeah. data is at the center of all of those workflows. Yep. I was listening to a podcast recently where the guest kind of likened AI security as really a form of data protection problem, which I yeah. tend to agree with. Okay. Yep. Even the OWASP for LLM top 10 calls out several items that are directly related to your data. So poisoning data training sets, right? Yeah. That's a data perimeter problem. Theft of your models or any yeah. other company assets, that's a data perimeter problem. Allowing LLM excessive access to data it shouldn't be sharing, that's a data perimeter problem. Yeah. But again, that's all to say data perimeter is just one more layer of your defense in depth approach, right? And yeah. so prior to it, accordingly, according to all of the other risks you're trying to mitigate, but there's no doubt that the concepts can apply to, to any company of any maturity level. And, and I'm glad you called it out as well, because I think you and I are old enough to know that we were called information security before cybersecurity was a thing. The whole concept was that we're trying to protect information. It wasn't holistic enough. Then we moved on to cybersecurity as a term. But if we start, that is the foundation of what the yeah. entire industry is built on. So it's it 100% like lays it out completely. And the same with AI cybersecurity podcast as well. The data conversation, again, we can't even do that without data. Yeah. I was going to ask for people who are after hearing this conversation, go, okay, I guess data is really important for me and my organization. I don't even think I'd considered network segmentation or data parameter as a thing. And if we were to have a starting point for, because you've obviously done this in your organization, you've gone through this, you've gone through different phases of it. And the whole talk was around the maturity you guys have had across the board after you started, from the time you started, the challenges you had, and what do you think is the next step? I'm curious for people who are starting feeling inspired by, I heard Tyler, okay, I'm going to, I'm, re I'm ready. I'm going to start doing this. What would you say is a good starting point? And you throw SCPs in there, organization in there. So what are some of the components and moving parts that they need to look into for implementation? Yeah, I think it starts before you even are hands on keyboard. And that is as a company really try to identify, do a threat analysis on your environment and a risk assessment and identify the gaps where you feel you don't have the appropriate controls, right? Where are the places that you can most quickly pay down risk and start mm -hmm. there? Obviously, the calculus is going to be dependent on your risk tolerance of the company, industry, the regulatory and data privacy requirements. But I would start there. I, I think talking to folks about this, the folks that have been successful really try to use quantitative measures in large part because it reinforces the effort to your business partners. And, and I'd go back to what I said previously, like having your business partners on board is much of the battle. And so I would start there first. And in parallel, if you're looking at your AWS organization and your data, identify the zones of trust that matter to you. Where is your data located? Who is accessing it? And where is it landing? And so identifying those access patterns and what data is crossing those zones of trust within your environment is, is probably the first step before you start crafting any automation or any policies. It's also the hardest step, I would say, given that there is 
essentially a lack of telemetry available out of the box to you, right? If you have a data set at your disposal, whether it's an S3 or Dynamo or RDS, wherever, very difficult to identify the users or roles that are accessing that data and where it's going. Like you do have CloudTrail. There's nothing in your CloudTrail log that says, hey, this crossed one of your zones of trust, or there are access patterns that aren't even logged by default. And so you're going to be playing with a little, it's a little more murky than you would like. And so mm -hmm. that's going to be like the next step before you start implementing and rolling out policies. We're into this episode for a special mention for Assistive Podcast, AI Cybersecurity Podcast. Yes, if you want to know more about the primer for LLM, AI, and all the acronyms that float around, what do you really need to know as a cybersecurity leader or practitioner in this field? That's what Caleb, yes, I have a co-host there who is equally smart and talented and currently is the chair of Cloud Security Alliance AI Safety Initiative. We both talk about the cybersecurity challenges of AI. What are other CISOs doing? We had the CISO of Entropic, the CISO of DeepMind, and a lot more other people who are trying to solve the security for AI and whether it is AI for security. You can find us on all the audio video platform, but also on AICybersecuritypodcast.com. Now back to the episode. Actually, it's a good point because I kind of threw the whole word of DMZ and restricted zone and all of that. What are the boundaries? I think it's, it's worthwhile calling out. People may not even understand what would be a data parameter scenario which would easily define boundaries. Because I think the example you gave earlier that, hey, AWS account, is it mine or is it my personal one or is it the actual organization one? Like something as simple as that. What are some of the examples that come to mind so people understand the boundaries? So to start defining zone of trust, like what would be an example of a zone of trust? So I think what is a zone of trust? And I think we've, I will say our team has probably stolen it from access analyzer. They use it to identify access that's outside of your account or yeah. outside of your organization, right? And so we've taken the phrase to mean, we use it more broadly to describe areas within your organization, likely parts that are at the OU level where you want to harden your controls and yep. limit access for some reason. You know, it might be business critical assets that you wanna only allow internal customers to. It might be regulatory requirements like PCI data, like that could be a zone of trust, right? But just in general, the first ones you probably think of are my AWS versus not my AWS, right? You might probably, might also think about internal zones of trust. So production data versus non-production data. I don't think there's too many use cases especially when it comes to a large financial services institution where you want to mix prod data into your non-prod environment, mm -hmm. right? That's typically not a good practice, but yeah. I think that applies for most people. There's also, again, there's PCI requirements. There's other regulatory requirements that can drive those discussions, but it's really about, really, I think I'm of them mostly at the OU level. Uh, I, was, I see what you mean. And I think it's worthwhile calling out as well that I think what we are referring to here, these are prevention controls. These are not detection. We're not trying to detect this is happening. We just want to stop that from happening in the first place. Yeah, I, I think they can bleed into each other depending on how you organize it, right? You can say, I should never see this type of pattern. Mm. And then you can go create a detection on it. I think it's really helpful to draw a line between here's a control and here's my preventative. Here's my detective, whether that's yep. some internal detection or access analyzer, and then some corrective action. Maybe you have automation that goes and updates a policy like that, that's been changed out of band. Like, so drawing the thread between all of those is important, but you're absolutely right. Whether it's SVPs or endpoint policies or resource policies, they're typically more preventative in nature. Yeah. And do you take this a step further as well? You called out the organization. There's the whole AWS organizations and SCPs you called out as well. That could be the difference. I've been in organizations where we had multiple AWS organizations as well. So people who are thinking about this from like a layer deeper, you're primarily looking at defining zone of trust at an AWS org level using SCPs. SCPs or endpoint policies or, or even resource oh, yeah. policies. I think it, it, it depends on the maturity level okay. of the customer, right? I think most medium-sized companies are probably already using SCPs or permission boundaries. Like they're already using elements of data perimeter. I yeah. think really taking a step back, seeing where they are, seeing what they have and where they can fill those gaps is probably like the best way to start. And that a lot of that is driven by your org hierarchy. Like mm -hmm. best practices for AWS is not to structure your org like your HR diagram. It's structure it and organize your accounts under OUs where you want to apply similar controls. For yes. data perimeter, it's it's really the same thing. If 
hey, I want to apply a set of controls around this OU for various reasons. And, and that can be SCPs. That's probably the first place most people start because it's the most mature, I think. But it also involves things like when we talk about resource policy, how, how are your developers actually rolling out resource policies? How are you adding controls there? And so all of those things, the ways you do business and your org kind of roll into your strategy. I learned something there as well, because I think initial perspective that I had was primarily revolving around using SVPs for it, but you called out VPC endpoints, resource policies. I think uh, Meg did a good talk as well on it. So I've, I've, I've got an interview with her on the entire VPC endpoint policy challenges and fine grained yeah. course game. That was, I, I, imagine, I think in your talk also, you called it out as well. That was a relevant talk, which kind of brings back to the whole data perimeter perspective as well. Yeah. It, it, it was a great talk. There, there is a lot of different philosophies when it comes to what level of maturity you start managing endpoint policies for yeah. those that may be less familiar. They, when you spin them up, there are allow all by default, right? Which is, I can understand the motivation why you yeah. don't want to break something. They're, I won't call them new, but they're newer than some other, especially interface endpoints um, are newer than um, some other controls. But yeah, how do you organize them? within your org is really interesting. And once you get into managing policies, that's where you really have to make some decisions. Yeah. And maybe just to bring back one more point where you said, hey, the conversation about data parity need to start before your hands on keyboard even happen. Is there like an exercise you had to go through with say, and maybe inspiration of other people? Because talking about business partners, talking about AppSec people or application developers, you, I almost feel like what you're also referring to is that there needs to be an understanding of what is, like there is an information security policy in the organ, but then there is a policy that's followed versus just understanding like which one applies to the cloud versus which one applies to on-premise. Like we haven't even spoken about hybrid environments yet. How, oh, yeah. I mean, how does this play out in hybrid environments? Yes, the way I would define hybrid, and this is key, I think there's like difference of opinion too here is in general, I think of a hybrid network as two or more different platforms that need to exchange data that could be brokering access between two different cloud providers. Yeah. Right. Like most large companies are multi-cloud now, yeah. some even by choice. How do you broker access between an on-prem data center and or a colo with one or more of the CSPs? You've even, even got large SaaS platforms working their way into that conversation. What point do you consider them kind of CSPs? That kind of philosophy. Um, but I, I would say when you're talking about how API calls are made and the identities used, if you're using endpoint pull-up and VPC endpoints, a lot of those calls will stay on AWS's network. But if you are making cross region calls, those yeah. will take the default route out. If you're using services that don't support private link, or maybe you're making calls to another vendor who's not in AWS, all of that's going to take the default route out your network. And so. While we talk about data perimeter items in AWS, hopefully part of your larger strategy is addressing that other default route. How are you putting security controls around that default route that your calls are taking? If you're in an on-premise environment, you hopefully have those calls traversing your network stack where you might sure. use things like firewall or data loss prevention. That's the first thing I would think about if you are in a hybrid network. Yep. And then how do you broker access between your colo and your AWS tenant? Like how are calls coming in? Like how are you leveraging AWS identities in those hybrid applications? And that's important because it's not just a security concern, but it's, it's a scalability concern. Are you using OWASP and, and JSON web tokens or are you using you know, X509 certificates for your machine identities? Things like World Anywhere really mm -hmm. shines here. But that puts a huge premium on secrets management in your on-premise environment. How are you effectively managing access through your colo and data center? There's things like expecting partners from various cyber ranges. Those tend to be, at least nowadays, a little more dynamic. So maybe you're using mutual TLS that authenticates not just the client, but the server. And so there are some considerations there. Then, of course, you also got EDOS and botnet mitigation, things like that. Would you say as you have gone through this journey, obviously there's so many moving parts. There's the whole hybrid network. Then there is, hey, it's a multi-cloud. Then there is the concept of what is my zone of trust. There's a lot of work involved in the beginning. And I clearly don't imagine it happened in one week. 
took a few months for you years as well. In all of this, I think in the beginning, were there some challenges that you guys came across? Now, obviously, I don't think it ever finishes building because we keep adding more products and kind of things, it keeps evolving by its own. What were some of the challenges in the beginning? I'm curious because I wonder people who are listening in who are very inspired to do this on their own. Yes, there is a possibility. Technically, this is possible. What are some of the challenges that you had either from a getting people on board perspective or even actually technical as well, if you had some? Man, that's a, that's a big question. You, we could do an entire 45 minutes just on lesson. But <laughs> I, I think, no, I, I do think the things that I think have led to successful deployment of these strategies, whether it's things that we've learned or things I've learned from other companies. Again, I will just put some of the impact of communication and how it can have impact your speed to roll out yep. is incredibly important. Your business partners have to be part of the process. They need to be aware of your goal. Because there's a lack of telemetry, there's a higher risk of causing an outage. Yep. What I can tell you is you can use that to your advantage in a lot of ways. And that is, Shish, if you've ever probably bought a product, you've gone home, you've been excited, and let's say it broke, and you oh. called them up, but it was great customer service, and they fixed it right away for you. And in some ways, again, going back to my previous experience in sales, when you have those situations, you can reinforce the belief in your org and your priorities by helping yeah. your customers fix their problems. And yeah. so I think that is one of the lessons that I would tell everybody to take communicate and make it easy for people to complain to you. It's a customer service problem in a lot of ways. I would say, second thing is being able to manage exceptions at scale it is really important. You're never going to get every access pattern logged or things like that. And so being able to point to a piece of documentation or a process to your team to say, hey, if you need that thing, go do it this way. Yeah. What we've tried to do, and I think this has been successful, is we have all of our controls version controlled and we have them, our application team to know about them. If they want to request access, they can go make a pull request in those repos. And in a lot of ways, it takes our security team, which is small but mighty out of the critical path. And so I think that's really important. We don't have to, we don't have to write every policy for application teams. They can do the brunt of the work, but if they follow our, our standards, we can just review it and roll it out once it's been approved. And so that's really easy. You asked about things that we've learned. I think one thing that's been really eye-opening, and I think companies that are going through a digital transformation will also experience this, is the rise of what I would call shared services. And those are things that every application that you service in your org might need to access at one time or the other. Yeah. We probably didn't do a, a good enough job of thinking about where we wanted to put those in our org hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so we are now trying to pull those out from those very hard internal boundaries into a, a, an, another OU. Okay. And you have to think about those shared services as you're migrating applications from your on-prem environment to cloud. They're not just servicing your cloud applications. They're servicing all of your applications on-prem. Do you want to start poking holes in that hard boundary that you, you thought you think is really important? Mm -hmm. Probably not, right? And that is probably the, the highest kind of like priority. I would tell people, hey, you probably haven't thought about it, but really think about this. Think about where you want to be in three or four years and start organizing your accounts maybe differently or thinking about them differently. And, and the last thing, operationalizing access analyzer, that is huge. You're going to okay. see the number of resources in an organization as you grow that number is going to grow exponentially. It's going to get into the millions pretty quickly. Yeah. And so analyzing those kind of resource policies and access patterns at scale is really where access analyzer shines. I, I guess your point, I wasn't aware it can actually do, can it still do multi-account as it looks after everything? It just looks across your entire AWS footprint, access analyzer? So it will look at resource policies at two levels and say, you are allowing access to this resource by an identity that's outside of your account. That's one. Oh, and then right. you're allowing identity, sorry, you're allowing access to an identity outside of your organization. And you can think of that as public, right? You're making yeah. something public. And so you've yeah. got those two zones of trust that Active Analyzer reports on. Yeah. Either of them might be equally important, but I would definitely say that public access that Access Analyzer um, can highlight is 
very important, especially if you've got developers that are just new to cloud and onboarded and they're building quickly, people make mistakes. And so that can be the first line of defense and highlighting those and addressing those gaps. And so it's funny because we had a conversation with Bridget Johnson. She's the GM for Axe Analyzer. They're adding a lot more capability into it. So it's pretty good to know that there's actually, it, it, it does go across uh, quite a few things. I was going to say, in terms of shared services that you called out, that became a challenge for you. Was there, obviously that's a byproduct of working in a digital transformation space. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you also mentioned shared data layers as well. Because I, so I'm curious if you can peel a few layers on that shared data layer as well. Yes, there might be data sets that you want to expose to certain customers or your entire org, or you want to limit to certain customers. Yeah. And so I think organizing those data sets in the right OU where you can add light control. If it's a, a publicly facing data set, you're going to have that in hopefully some sort of what I kind of equate to like a DMZ like account. And that's going to be a very separate set of different set of controls around those versus your internal data sets. And so, again, going back to how you organize your controls and your org hierarchy, you're going to have very different ways to allow access on each. You've got the idea of shared services. Examples of that that, that we've seen are things like publishing golden AMIs that you want to use oh, yeah. in your org. Things like security agents you install on VMs or maybe use Amazon's private CA to vend certificates. You want that available to at least parts or all of your org. Things like, and, and it makes me shudder when I say this, shared API keys, right? There are certain vendors that want you to share an API key <laughs> to access their services. Yep. They know who they are, won't call them out, hope it changes. That might be something that you want to share across your org. Like, so separating, whether it's data sets or even those services, I, yep. I think of them similarly and are they going to be accessed by all of my org? Okay, that might have a different set of controls. And are they going to be accessed by a subset of my org? There are different AWS condition keys that you can use for each of those. I'm glad you called it out as well, because it's probably sometimes hard for people to judge the maturity of where they are. And whether some of the tactical questions that I have from this is that, which environment am I, am I should I start this in dev, test, prod? Like, where, where do you recommend people start with this? So... If you are at the point where you are rolling out controls, like more restrictive controls, <clears throat> don't yellow it and prod. Like that sleeve don't. You're not going to have too many happy customers. I would say that the tact we took, and I think the tact that's made the most sense talking to others is rolling out progressively throughout your environment. So again, maybe you have different staging or non-production environments. Roll it out there first. We allowed bacon time, like anywhere from days to weeks. And then we also, as part of our migration, identified what we consider higher risk customers and said, hey, can you go validate this? Things are still working as expected. And we did that throughout all of our rollout, even into prod. And yeah. so that's probably how I would say you want to get started. Now, what type of controls you're going to roll out, like how restrictive, what zones of trust, that can vary. But I yeah. think holistically rolling them out through environments is easily the best way to go. And is there a recommendation on starting with, we obviously called out the resource policies, VPC endpoint policies. And I think, is there an easy or a hard one to start with uh, from a tactical perspective? I think SCPs are probably where most people start. Address your organization, users, and roles. And I think when you talk about data parameter, part of the question is, well, my controls... Are we worried about external threats or internal threats? I think SVPs can really add to hard external boundaries, blocking public access for ECR or S3. Like those really hard controls are the first place to start. Those are like the easy wins, I think. Yep. Now, organizing your SVPs to where you block public access in certain areas, but maybe you have publicly exposed stuff in another area. Those are the first places to start. I think yep. you can then start to graduate to, okay, I do want to allow certain access between zones of trust, or maybe I want to not allow action between zones of trust. And you start getting there a little more, what I would call a little more fine-grained in nature, as opposed to just a box around my AWS versus not, those internal zones of trust. So I'd start there. I think endpoint policies are probably more of an advanced maturity level, just okay. because of SVPs, they don't affect other organizations users or roles, right? They don't affect service linked roles or 
service principles. VPC endpoint policies do impact every identity that's used over that endpoint policy. And so there's a lot of gotchas that come with endpoint policies in practice. Yeah. I think you only see allow statements in the endpoint policies because if you use a deny, you're probably inadvertent, inadvertently blocking some access that you didn't intend to block. So yeah. I think that's a little more mature. Resource policies, I would start with SCPs. That's probably like layer zero. Okay. You know, making sure that how you enforce certain policy standards with whether it's a preventative or detective like access analyzer, I would consider that a starting step with SCPs. And how often would you review them? Because organizations move quite quickly as well these days. Great question. I think if, if organizations are growing their cloud footprint, you're going to find that your security teams are probably tweaking your SCPs often. As the needs of the business change, as more bespoke use cases are onboarded, I think you're going to start tweaking those pretty yeah. often. I think resource policies get tweaked more often. You have things like roles that need access to every bucket, right? Or every KMS key, things for backups or incident response, like those get updated pretty often. Yeah. What I think is maybe a better goal to have is having a periodic review of those public accesses that you allow or, or access to external actors, things like allowing vendors to do things in your environment or allowing your principals to access vendors. Are those still needed? Who are the point of contact for those kind of things like tagging can really come in handy there at the account level or the resource level to identify those people of interest that you can coordinate with. But that's a huge, I think, part of data printer is just life cycling those kind of policies. Mm -hmm. And would you say in terms of investing time and effort into this as well, obviously you are leading a team. Uh, what kind of skill set am I looking at in my team as well for this? It's a great question. I don't know what probably people think of as cloud security, what kind of skills. I, to me, <laughs> yeah. it's almost like what's a data science? Data science is now programmers and people who are familiar with some of those tools. Cloud security really is equal parts at least on, on, in our teams, they are equal parts programmers. You yeah. got to have programming background, I think, in, in many ways. You've got to have security background, obviously. You've got DevOps experience, right? Especially if you're using CI, CD, and preventative control, like DevOps is really important there. Then you've got like operational experience, right? These tools are these things that are always running in your environment. They need to be running 24 seven. You need to have on-call support, right? When things go down and aren't working, you've got a, you might get a call in the middle of the night. So yeah. just a, it's a combination of all of those together, plus probably some I'm missing, plus the soft skills that come with customer service. I think uh, yeah. those are, you've got to take those into account as you're building not only a data perimeter strategy, but you're just security organization in general. Yeah. And, and there's just a lot there to, to unpack. And because you mentioned CSCD pipeline, the, the reason I was asking about that skill set question specifically now was also because the complexity of technology that comes across, I think there's CSCD pipelines, there's working with SVCs, GitHub, GitLab, I mean, mm -hmm. Jenkins, just throw every open source spanner out there. And in a fairly large scale environment, there's a more growing need for things to be developer friendly. And so far, we spoke about SCP, VPC, endpoints, policy, and all of that. I, I don't know what's the easiest way to answer, but apart from just asking, is it developer-friendly? Am I going to be fired by, by a developer who's just angry because I removed their access to something super important? That's a great question. Something we think a lot about. I think in order to be successful, you've really got to go to where developers are, are going. Try to add security to, add to the easy path. What do your team's typical day-to-day -day workflows look like? And... Can you bake some of those controls into their workflows? Hopefully you can do it transparently where they don't even see the difference. I, I think of CI CD is probably the biggest benefit here. I look at a CI CD pipeline as like a hanger and you can hang all of these different things in. Things like you can use infrastructure as code and then things like infrastructure as code scanning tools, whether it's OPA or Chekhov or PFSec, whatever it is. You yeah. can do things like cost analysis, like cost impact. You can do bake in your SaaS tool in there. Like those things, I think, and I hate the term shift left because it's taken on <laughs> it's the most cliche thing to say. So, uh, I think most people that use it don't see the impacts, right? Yeah. But if you can bake it into your developer's workflows by default, 
I think you can actually pay down risk with very little impact to your developer's productivity. And I think you can make them more productive in some ways. And so like improving that experience yep. and even automating things that weren't automated, like that's a huge blocker for a lot of organizations is I've got to go through this manual step. I need to get reviews from certain people. Can you automate that stuff? Can you use some sort of workflow or ticketing system to have that move a little quicker? Like yep. those are the kind of things that like, if they're not done well, you're going to have either blocking the business or sometimes worse, you're going to have developers find ways around those, those tools. And that's a bad place to be too. Very well said, because yeah, I definitely believe most of the applications we're working with, our customers are technically developers of producing it. So going back to what you were saying as well, at the end of the day, if they're not happy, then we're definitely not going to have any progress irrespective. As you were going through this and we spoke about the challenges, we were talking briefly about preventative and detective controls as well. In terms of the team skill set and like the amount of effort that was required but for preventative and detective control, were the challenges faced there as well in terms of technical challenges or any other challenges you faced? Yeah, so I think analyzing resource policies at scale is really hard. We lean on those CICD scanning tools like OPA, but I haven't found a tool that can catch every edge case. There's mm. always things that we'll get through. I think one of the things we really tried to do was, hey, let's get to what's the 20% of effort that can get us 80% there? Like, yeah, how yeah. can we get the biggest bang on our buck for our time? And we've tried to catch all of the edge cases we can, but then we compensate the lack of maybe that last 10% where there's a law, the diminishing returns in your investment. Really use Access Analyzer there to catch those really egregious violations of policies. I think the reverse is true on detective controls for access patterns. Like it's really hard to add alerting and monitoring on certain access patterns, right? Like things are always happening. New use cases are being onboarded. You might not have up-to-date monitoring and alerting and you're getting a lot of false positives for a new access mm -hmm. pattern, right? That's a really hard thing to do at scale. And I think one of the areas I think the industry is going is really looking at things like data security posture management tools or Kim tools that can identify that anomalous behavior or toxic pairs and things like that, that you can start detecting on and remediating ahead of the fact. And so I think those are the two places where I think have been really tricky. And I think there's a lot of room to go on the tool sets available and then operationalizing them in various environments. So that's one of the areas I would probably highlight the most. And anything that worked in getting all the business stakeholders on board onto this journey as well. I'm going to go shift left over here again. It's like <laughs> in that kind of world, people talk about the fact that, hey, find the friendliest team you can work with to start off at least proving the concept and then use that as an example to move to the next team and so on. Were there any things that you found that were helpful in getting the stakeholders who may perhaps be a bit hesitant in the beginning to have them on board? I don't believe any application team wakes up and says, you know what I don't care about? Security. You're like, no one actually says that, right? Yeah. What I think, and this is, I think you had Chris Ferris on recently, and I think oh, yeah. he made this point, which I totally agree with. When you're talking to application teams, aside from using data, if you can, those quantitative measures, if you can point to a real world breach and say, hey, these are the kind of things we're trying to prevent. And here are the controls that we're going to help you add. And we're going to be right alongside you. If you can show them that real world example of millions of dollars of fines or whatever the outcome is, yeah, that to me is more impactful to a development team than just saying, hey, go do this thing. Here's what we're doing. And guess what? Your boss said we're doing this, so you got to do it. That's not... At the end of the day, it's the developers who are hands on keyboard doing this stuff. Like you've got to, yeah. you've got to show them that like you're in it with them as opposed to just sitting on this ledge above them and saying, thou shalt do these things. I don't think yeah. that's an effective uh, strategy. Yeah. And I, I probably would add one more thing here as well, uh, as, as you were saying it and what you mentioned, made me also think about the fact that if these kind of preventative controls do exist and you can sprinkle some detection control as well, the overall burden on your own cloud security team is low as well or over time because all the CSPM tools and everything else, a lot of false positives, is a, I, like the native tools as well. 
So this could potentially just be good for your company to start doing this just to reduce the workload overall, right? Yeah. If your only way to scale out on your security organization is to add headcount, I think you're setting yourself up for failure. Show me a company that's got unlimited budget to hire security. Like they don't <laughs> use the best, right? Yeah. The mantra do more with less. And I yeah. think the only way to even make a dent is to use automation, like whether it's e even those tools, like you mentioned, whether it's FinApp or PSPM, there's a load of them. Even operationalizing those things requires an upfront investment from the business. Because like you yeah. said, they can add a ton of false positives and add even more work to your plate, right? Yeah. Like before you start seeing the value. So I yeah. think you've got to use automation, but you've got to be upfront with your business partners around, hey, here's the type of investment like we're going to have to make and headcount we're going to have to devote to it. We talked about some of the large SaaS providers too. There, there is some of these large SaaS providers that are built on the hyperscalers. They, they have their own IAM constructs, right? You've got their own abstracted form of compute and storage. If it starts talking like a cloud service provider, if it starts walking like a cloud provider, it might be a cloud provider, right? I, I'm curious to see how that plays out in the future. And at what point does the security team say, Hey, you know what? We're going to have to treat this like our other peer zero hyperscalers in the security rigor that we require from them. I'm, I'm really interested to see how that plays out because I think that's one of the future items that I think we're going to see. Yeah, I think it's a good point because you almost feel like the AI kind of kicked off a lot of these SaaS yeah. providers where you're in this, like you've fed so much data into it, the models being built in it. There is like hooks into every cloud provider as well, putting data... It's almost like you thought your AWS environment was very crown jewel, but then there's another one, which just happens to be a SaaS product as well. Yeah. Seems to have equal amount of sensitive data in there. Data perimeter is not just, again, about your AWS tenant. It's about your on-prem environment. Like a lot of these SaaS providers, you can take your data and you can send it to other vendors through that SaaS provider, right? So yeah. there's additional considerations, especially when it comes to data perimeter around yeah. hey, what does the authorization authentication mechanisms look like there? You can run Kubernetes and Snowflake now, right? The complexity is only growing, right? And so having that overarching strategy, that cloud provider agnostic or platform agnostic, I think is really step zero, like we talked about for yeah. any maturing organization. Yeah. I, I, and I, I guess the final question from a technical perspective is if for people who love the whole levels of maturity, Okay, I may be level one today because you guys spoke about AWS organization, SCP is a good point to start. Maybe resource policy attached next to it as well, but then you move on to the VPC policies and everything else. How would you describe the maturity, at least in the experience you've had so far? What's a good maturity you're going to think as, hey, this is a good starting point. And starting point, level zero is you don't have any of this. And level one, what would that level one look like? And what could be level four or five that perhaps you're aiming for in the future? Yeah, great question. I think baseline maturity, I would characterize as you've identified your internal versus external access, like that zone of trust, and you started locking that down with SCPs and other controls. You've probably, hopefully started with, hey, these are the services where I have my crown jewels. Well, for a lot of organizations, that's S3 typically. So start with that service and how you're adding controls be a pipeline or console, might like start there. And then hopefully, like we talked about, you're using some sort of IAC, CICD to, to bake in your security best practices there. You, you might have some IR playbooks there, hopefully, but they might be manual, right? I think you graduate up to maybe medium by identifying additional internal boundaries, right? And adding controls at those levels. You've expanded the controls around additional services that you maybe even store data or move data. I think you probably have more robust controls and, and detective controls there. And then you, you graduate to the advanced level, which I think this is where the immaturity and some of the tools we have, but you're, you're probably, hopefully, I would love to get to a point where you're feeding changes in your access patterns in real time to your detection stack, right? So you can update your detections as new access patterns are brought online so you don't have those false positives. I think you're probably adding detections through, again, some of those SaaS providers likely, or being like new AWS services for toxic pairs, 
highlighting that anomalous behavior, it, using IAM policy suggestions more frequently. And then you probably have, hopefully, pseudo-automated incident response playbooks to clean up access that shouldn't be there. So I think of those as the three kind of levels right now of maturity. Thank you for sharing that. That's most of the technical questions I had. I've got three uh, fun questions for you as well. Okay. First one being, what do you spend most time on when you're not trying to solve cloud security challenges in the world? <laughs> so I'm, I'm a huge basketball fan. That's my jam. I live in San Antonio, home of the San Antonio Spurs. I probably watch 75 out of the 82 games a year. Oh, no, wow. Okay. I, yeah. I'm a weirdo. No question about it. Like, you want to do a podcast on basketball, I'm your guy. So I, I do a ton of that. I, again, I have a three-year-old. That's a ton of my time. It's awesome. I've got an awesome partner, too, in my wife. But that's where the bulk of my time is spent right now. Interesting. Although this is not the question I'm curious to ask. Between LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, and Steph Curry, who would you rank? I, and I was like, I know it's a super hard question. You, you, only because you mentioned NBA. And I'm like, ooh, I wonder if you have some thoughts on on these four people who seem to, at least I seem to keep coming across them. I love to watch them play. I love to watch the games mm -hmm. as well. Obviously, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant are, are a different story. But uh, do you have a preference order there? Or who's your favorite NBA player at the moment? Man, you're setting me up to get flamed, I think. The oh, are set up, <laughs> well, you know? it'll, be it'll be funny. If you and I are the only people who enjoy NBA, the entire cloud security, sure, then it's... No one cares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who is my favorite? Well, who's your favorite? Living or dead? irrespective who's your favorite nba player ever? I, I grew up i was born in early 80s right so i remember watching jordan in his heyday i remember watching the first game when he came back from playing baseball i remember that watching him go through the knicks with all the beating he took that's one of my first kind of like memories of basketball i went to a bunch of games when spurs were on the rise i, I would say my all-time favorite player again i'm partial to the spurs is Monte ginobili because just the passion he played with, the, just the dedication, just he would do anything to win. I think you can see the same thing in players like Kobe and LeBron, which is why I love watching them or loved watching them play. Out of those three players you've lifted, like I, I think LeBron is clearly head and shoulders, the, the best player, arguably the best of all time. I, yeah. I don't want to get into that conversation because that's like... <laughs> I know. That is, like, like, that is, we that are, is definitely some flame setting conversation. Like, yeah, <laughs> we will get aggregated i'm sure yes <laughs> but, oh but well, thanks for sharing that okay i'll probably put a put a pin on the nba one to continue another day the second question i had was what is something that you're proud of that is not on a social media man i, I, would, I would definitely say being a dad I, I think that's i was i've had so much fun over the last three and a half years is our works right behind me i mentioned in the top potty training it's a wild experience Man, my house is one big episode of Naked and Afraid. Like he's naked <laughs> and we're just afraid. That's pretty much what my life is right now. He's awesome. I have a ton of fun. Again, I have an awesome partner. My wife is amazing. She goes from teaching first grade and 20, 20 kids to like coming home to him. Because oh. I don't know. Imagine going from your job, you're a hands-on keyboard every day, going home, and then that's what you have to do. <laughs> that's your fun, right? Yeah, I can't at, a, at a much more personal level as well. Yeah. It's like this actually feels it hurts every time the person is upset. You're like, what's going on? Like you can't have that separation of boundary as well at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's amazing. She's so much better at her job than I am at mine. It's stupid, but she is one of the most important people in my life. and my son are the most important people in my life. But she's a huge reason why you know it's been so much fun. Well, thanks for sharing that. And the final question. What's your favorite cuisine or restaurant that you can share? Oh, man, Th that's a good one. I would say I'm from South Texas, so Tex-Mex is right at the top. I could eat that every day. I don't because I, I wouldn't be alive for very long. I got to spend a few more years for sure. I'm, I will tell you this. I, I love Indian cuisine. I love Italian cuisine. My big thing is wherever I am, I want to go eat where the locals are. Like that is my thing. What are the yeah. local getting? If I'm in whatever new city, that's what I'll ask people to do. And I'm pretty open. I think San Antonio's got a great food thing, but others have, that's our thing, me and my wife, when we travel. But I would say, to answer your question, Italian. There's not a pizza huh. I've, I've ever disliked. Really? Wait, so between, see, this is a New York pizza or a, oh. well, <laughs> okay, like, yeah. I, 
this, this, this again, I think this entire episode is now bringing on NBA fire and visa fire. <laughs> Pineapple and a pizza conversation. <laughs> I celebrate all the pizzas. I do not understand people that get so worked up over fruit on a pizza. Who cares? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> stuff goes on pizza. Like anything well, I goes mean, on pizza. To be fair, Italians did add chocolate on the pizza. So like the calzone is supposed yeah. to be like Nutella uh, and chocolate. So I don't think it's like a, a sin to have that. Consider people who started the whole thing don't mind it. So I don't know why the rest of the world cares that much. But I'm, I'm going to, again, pin, the, pin it. I'll, I'll probably <laughs> uh, talk about this with you. I mean, hopefully get to meet in person soon as well. But where can people find you on the internet so they can connect and talk more about all of this? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. That's an easy place to look me up. Uh, I'm on Twitter or, or X at J Tyler Warren um, is yeah. my handle. I don't do a ton of commenting. I'm not the most active. I'm a watcher. I'm a yeah. silent browser. So that's probably also the easiest way to get a hold of me. Awesome. I'll put those things in there as well. But thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate this. I think it's been very valuable. I got to know so much as well. And I'll put your talk on the show notes as well and the description so people get to hear that as well. But thank you so much for coming on the show. I look forward to talking more to you about data security, data parameter, how we go further from this as well. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Ashish. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for uh, having me talk about NBA as well. I appreciate that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for listening or watching this episode of Cloud Security Podcast. We have been running for the past five years, so I'm sure we haven't covered everything cloud security yet. And if there's a particular cloud security topic that we can cover for you in an interview format on Cloud Security Podcast or make a training video on tutorial on Cloud Security Bootcamp, definitely reach out to us on info at cloudsecuritypodcast.gv. By the way, if you're interested in AI and cybersecurity, as many cybersecurity leaders are, you might be interested in our sister podcast called AI Cybersecurity Podcast, which I run with former CSO of Robinhood, Caleb Seema, where we talk about everything AI and cybersecurity. How can organizations deal with cybersecurity on AI systems, AI platforms, whatever AI has to bring next as an evolution of chat, GPT, and everything else continues. If you have any other suggestions, definitely drop them on info at cloudsecuritypodcast.gv. I'll drop them in the description and the show notes as well so you can reach out to us easily. Otherwise, I will see you in the next episode. Peace.